up everyone I'm back and today we have a new addition to the fleet it's not that noisy scion this is a 2000 Ford Expedition 4x4 with the 5.4 liter V8 automatic it's XLT so it's one of the it's like the base model essentially but it does have leather and some nice nice other additions so it'll be a a good daily driver the Durango is gonna go to my uh, brother-in-law because he needs a car so as much as I like the Durango this will be a fun new project the uh, everything everything on it runs good I mean the uh, everything works the front driver and passenger seat need new uh, leather cushions on the seat portion and then there's some paint issues on the roof a little bit of rust nothing big just surface rust so I'm gonna go through this but First project we got to do on it, when I bought it, the guy told me it was leaking a little bit of coolant and it sure is. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it in the driveway and uh, see where we're at. I'm assuming it's the water pump coming from the weep hole. That's what he told me. So I already got a water pump, so we'll go ahead and uh, get that replaced. All right, stay tuned. All righty guys, now it might not seem like much, but I get so excited about these. I mean, I know it's an old car, but I really, really like the Ford modular platform. When I worked for Ford and when I was going to Ford school, I uh, cut my teeth on these modulars. I've had how many, but six different Mustangs. I've built countless modular engines, different compression ratios, different heads, different cams, you name it. And I really like the platform. I mean, the Chevy LS platform is an insanely good platform too. I really, really dig it. I mean, I had a Silverado SS with the LQ9 and I loved it, but it's for, I always seem to come back to the Ford Modular platform. It's, you know, fairly, I mean, it's it's a really efficient engine. I mean, compared to, today, to today's standards, they don't, uh, you know, stack up to like the EcoBoost or anything. But, I mean, back when these were made, you know, this was a great way to, uh, you know, move a heavy SUV along. And they're not, uh, they're not that hard to work on once you figure them out. And they call them modular because everything pretty much... You know, it's modular, you can use it elsewhere. Like these cylinder heads, this is the 5.4, so this is the larger of the two engines, but these cylinder heads are interchangeable. This thing, like this cylinder head will go over here if you take a couple plugs out of the front of the head and move them around. Like literally, they're interchangeable. This is a 5.4, but these same heads can go on a 4.6. The 5.4, the engine block on each side is slightly taller, and the uh, intake manifolds are a little different to accommodate the height, but you know, air filter is going to be the same, water pumps the same, alternators the same, ignition coils are the same, injectors are the same. I mean, it's all the same. The 4.6s are a little easier to work on because back here where you have to get your hands under, you have a little bit more room. But, I mean, these are great engines and they used them in everything Ford made. I mean, you find them in F-150s, Expeditions, Econoline vans. They used them in, you know, the Crown Vic, the Crown Vics that now, you know, that people used as taxis. They used to use them in police cars. And they're pretty much all the same. Police cars had slightly different tuning and a different air intake, and they didn't have a governor on them. But it, more or less, it was all the same. And these things are just known to run for a stupid amount of miles without really having any issues, as long as you keep the oil changed. These were uh, notorious for if you went low on oil, you'd have issues with them. But I mean, you can. I know guys with uh, you know four or five hundred thousand. I had a Grand Marquis that I sold to a buddy with three hundred ninety on it, and it ran perfectly. So they're really good engines. Um, pretty easy to work on I know it doesn't look like it there's a lot of stuff in here but um yeah I mean I got some projects to do on this like this bat I mean these battery connections are bad and when you drive when you drive the truck you can kind of see the voltage gauge moving around so I don't think it's getting a very good connection judging by the amount of corrosion and uh the condition those terminals are in so I'm gonna be doing the water pump on this one because I'm losing coolant out the bottom so the first step before you do any of that is uh you're gonna want to basically open the reservoir and make sure there's no pressure in there so that way when you drain it it doesn't uh, blow all over you and then this is actually the uh <laughs> this is the rod for the jack for the spare tire you stick it you stick the end in here and twist it and then it goes up so um i'm gonna go ahead and get my gloves on and get started on this and i'll uh, um, document it so you guys can follow along all right we're under the truck and one of the first things you'll notice is there's a skid plate here and the 4x4 versions of these expeditions and some of the F-150s got these skid plates. So, 
just to help protect the uh, front of the motor from road debris and stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm not gonna bore you by taking all these bolts out on the video. So I'm gonna take them out and I'll come back with you. You can see we have much more access in here now and you can see the coolant dripping down right there, coming down the front of the engine. So the only thing above that is the water pump and then the thermostat housing. So what I'm gonna have to do is get up there and see if the, uh, see if the water, the, or I'm sorry, the thermostat housing is leaking. So now we can see that there actually is active leaking. We can go up top. Yeah, I'm gonna mention the four by four ones are kind of a pain in the butt to work on when you're down here. Like there's the oil filter. So they're not exactly the most convenient. I figured I'd mention that. Okay, so before we do anything with the water pump, here's the drain for the radiator. So we're gonna put a hose over it, capture the coolant so it doesn't go down the drain. I'm actually gonna get a bigger coolant drain hose. Okay, now before we do any work on it, we gotta get the coolant out. So we gotta get the coolant out. So what I'm gonna do is, I have this pan, basically just stick the coolant hose into the pan and catch it all, cause definitely don't want it going down the storm drain. Then the drain plug is right here. This little white one. So we'll just grab it here, break it loose. And usually on these, all the crap will sit right by the drain plug. So don't want to open it too much. So you can see it's coming out, but not very fast. You can see there's debris in there. so. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, shake the plug around a little bit. I'll get back with you. Pretty sure you don't wanna watch it draining. Alrighty, so while the coolant is draining, quite noisily I might add, I'm going to take this engine cover off. We need to take this air intake off too, so we can get to everything back here. Now, someone put an alarm in here so that a little alarm speaker's in the way. I know this is messy, but it's my little helpful table, so it is what it is. And get these out, take these out, take that out, and then we'll pull the motor cover off. All right, all the screws are out, and you can pull the motor cover off. Up here, you'll see the different parts of the engine. You got your EGR valve, your EGR valve solenoid that opens and closes it throttle position sensor, EVAP solenoid, power steering reservoir, then your uh, throttle cable and then the cruise control one. This is your air intake hose. This is the air filters in here. So in order to do this, we're gonna have to get this out of the way. So what you do is you take this off and this off. Get that out of the way then disconnect that. And then you'll take these two screws out and then make sure to unplug this. This is your air intake temperature sensor. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and take this off and I'll come back to you. You can either use a 5 16 a flathead or eight millimeter. Once you get this off, an important thing to look at is, sorry if my light's making it hard to see, little LED work light I picked up. It's nice because it's as bright as the halogens and it doesn't get hot. So at some point you can see a mouse has been in here putting his, there's mouse poop and some pine nuts he saved and what do you know some insulation down there that he's stuck in there anyway important thing to look at is look at the inside of here see i mean there's a little bit of fine dust in here but if there's a bunch of stuff in there like physical debris then your air filter is either missing clogged or it has a hole in it or it's just not working so it's an important thing to keep an eye on let me get up the light out of the way okay So, while we're in here, we're gonna do the thermostat. The thermostat lives under here. What the thermostat's job is, is it's basically a thermostatic valve. So what happens is your engine has two loops. 
you have your heater loop, which basically runs your heater cores back here, and then there's one in the back that makes your, uh, that creates the heat. So when you turn it on the heat setting, it looks like a little baby radiator, usually about that big. And so the cold air blows over the heater core and heats your, the interior of your car. Well, when you first start the car, the thermostat is closed. So it sends all the, it sends all the hot water up through here, going to the heater core, and then it comes back. But that's what it does. It just goes through a loop through the heater core as well. Once you're driving and you know the engine gets hot enough, if it needs, it'll open up this thermostat and start moving coolant through the radiator. So the thermostat is constantly modulating temperature. Well, if they stick open, you'll never get up to temperature. You'll probably get a check engine light because the engine can't get hot enough to work efficiently. And then if it's closed, you'll overheat. So that's why, you know, some people can get by if their car's overheating, they turn the heater on because if the thermostat's stuck closed, the heater core loop is still working. So it's a maintenance item. I don't know if it was ever done. So I'm gonna go ahead and do it while I'm in here. And I'm gonna try to flush these, uh, try to flush these heater hoses out too. Cause I noticed that the front heat's working but the back ones are really not that well. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. So I can hear that the, uh, I can hear that the coolant's almost done draining. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the air filter housing out of the way and this coolant hose out of the way so I can start taking stuff apart. There is a connector right here that goes to the mass airflow sensor, which measures how much air is going into the engine so that it can adjust the amount of fuel it needs to go in there, you know, to, uh, to maintain the proper air fuel ratio. Don't forget to unplug this when you pull this out. And this thing, there's no bolts or anything to it. You just more or less grab it, pull it up, and then you can pull it out down here. So I'll show you how to do it. That thing will stay. So get that, and then I usually come down here. See, it was barely even on. You can see the housing's all cracked. So that's probably why I've been getting dust through. These clamps are kind of a pain in the butt, so. But what you do with the housing is you just grab it and then pull up. Like that. You can see all the crap that's in here. This one's not in very good shape, so I might replace it. But, oh, there's rat poop in there too. So that's good. Looks like a mouse set up shop in there and either pooped or peed at some point. So that's always good to know, but anyway, that's out. So I'm going to remove the hose and, you rat poop. I'm gonna remove the hose and this upper part right here, and I'll be back with you. Alrighty, so got all the plastic screws for this thing off. Unfortunately, we have to take this off. It's kind of a nice little convenient parts holder, but it can't stay. So off she comes. Let's see what we got. Nice and clean. No joke, I swear I heard a mouse squeal a few minutes ago, so it'd be interesting if we found one. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get this hose off, and I'll be back. Hey guys, one thing I will show you, well, among other things, when you are working on the Fords, mind this. This is not fun when it grabs man parts. So same with the Super Duties, the Excursions, the F-150s, all of them have it, so what I normally do, it's a piece of foams from a, I use it as a kneeling pad when I'm pulling weeds or whatever, or working in the garage doing brakes or something. So I usually just put it over it, push down, and then it stays. So it avoids, uh, yeah, uncool situations, let's put it that way. But anyway, go ahead and put the cap back on loosely. Coolant's still draining out a little bit. So what we gotta do next is get this fan out of the way. Now there's a special fan clutch tool that you can get from AutoZone or O'Reilly or wherever you get your parts from. Come on. And it actually lets you take it off because what'll happen on this truck is if you see, you can't, there, the fan clutch doesn't let you spin the hub of the fan. None of them do, that's how the fan clutch works. So 
if you just spin this, you'll be here all day. So what you have to do is you get a special tool that'll grab onto this, let you unscrew it. On this truck, same with the F-150s, you can't take, well, I haven't found a way to take the fan shroud off while the fan is still on. So I'm gonna go get my special tool and I'll show you guys how to use it. Okay, it's a good idea to wear gloves when you do this, but as you can see, cables out of the way you have the water pump which is here in the back and your fan clutch which is here so what will happen is if you just try to spin the fan clutch it slips on the belt now that's no bueno so what you do here is you have this tool which goes in the back and it holds around all the bolts so one stays there and the other goes here, and you turn them opposite. So they have these holes in them, so you can use uh, so you can use half-inch drive ratchets if you need to. I'm gonna go ahead and take this guy off because it'll bite into your arm if the wrench slips. So I'm gonna take that off, and I'll come right back. All right, guys, it got pretty dark out, so I brought out ghetto shop light. Don't judge. Ghetto shop light used to hang over my workbench in my old house and I was gonna throw it away, but I decided to repurpose it. It's literally just an old school fluorescent tube light, but I took the tubes out and put LEDs so they don't shatter if you hit them with a tool. Then there's a bungee just connecting them over the top of the truck. So, you know, you can buy some professional ones for a lot of money, but this thing has always worked great. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get that thing off like I was saying, and I'll be back. Now you guys can see what's going on down here. So, put this holder tool there. I'm gonna put this one on here. Then I'm gonna put the ratchet in here. Switch the rotation and we'll see what happens. Okay. All right, it doesn't want to do that, so I'm gonna go get the persuader. All righty, let's try this. Now I have the big pipe wrench. Wow. All right, well, this fan clutch is getting replaced. I might have to use the air chisel my compressor is broken at the moment so might have to go see if i can uh borrow the neighbors really quick Alrighty, this is an old school trick i learned this is an air chisel and basically an air chisel is what it just chisels uh you can use it for chiseling metal breaking things apart well it's really good for this this was a trick we used to use back on the uh Ford 6.0s when the fan clutch would stick. So what you do is you come in here and you just put it on one of the lands of the nut. So like right here. So I'm having issues with the hose draped all the way over from my neighbor's house. So you just put it on there and then you give it some It's like an impact for nuts that you can't get off. Looks like someone already did it to put it on. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this fan clutch out while I'm doing all this just because I'm in here. But yeah, that's an old school trick. You can use it to put it back on, but I usually just use the wrenches and I put anti-seize on the hub so that it won't uh, so that it won't seize when you if you ever need to change it again. So that's it. I'm gonna go uh, thank the neighbor and put his air hose back. Okay, now that that's done, you gotta be really careful unscrewing this. Like when you get, when you can see like five threads, you wanna be really, really, really careful. Cause what'll happen is uh, if you're not, the, uh, the fan will actually fall forward and hit the radiator. And as, as you can see, this one's almost three inches thick. This is the radiator they did with the 5.4 and the tow package. So this is the really good radiator to have, but they're super expensive if you break them. So basically what you wanna do is kind of hold the blades 
as you unscrew them, like don't just spin it off because kind of an ask me how I know situation. I've replaced a couple of them just because I was careless. Especially if you have one of the older F-150s with the metal blades, they'll go right through the side of the aluminum radiator and not even think twice about it. So. Okay. so we got that out of the way. So what we're gonna do is take loose. There should be a bolt here and a bolt here. They're gonna be eight millimeters. So we're gonna loosen them, push the shroud forward, and then lift the shroud and the fan together at one piece. So, or at the same time. So I'm gonna take this guy off and this guy off and I'll be right back. All right, got both of the bolts out. So what you do is you basically pull the fan back in here, center it, then you lift up. That's like the driver's side usually fights a little because of the transmission line, but you can get it past it. So take this out the top because that's what will destroy your radiator. Place it aside. And then get the shroud out of the way. All right, we're getting there. The water pump is right here. So you gotta take the belt off. But you take your half inch ratchet. Let me close the drain. Oh man, this radiator's been leaking. Looks like I get to get a new one. All right, that sucks, but okay. Um, anyway, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, get the half inch and I'll show you how to do it. Okay, so to get the belt off, you have to relax the tensioner. This is the tensioner. So what you do is this thing has a spring in it and it keeps tension on the belt so that the belt will stay tight and not skip. So we're gonna push it down. So what you do is you put the ratchet in the square, push down and then pull it off the alternator and then it'll let it come all the way up. And you take that out and then you can pull the belt off. Now this one's kind of glazed, so I'm gonna go ahead and replace it while I'm in here. No sense in not doing it. Do it once and be done. So yeah, water pump is right here, but I'm pretty much done for the day. I'm gonna clean up and I'm gonna work on it a little tomorrow. We are back and we're gonna change the radiator since it is all crusty and is leaking. So, you can hear my assistant in the background. So, what I gotta do first is take these two bolts out. It will be a 10 millimeter. That one out. And we'll take this one out. Okay, now that they're out, the radiator can move. So what we gotta do is take this off and this off. These are the transmission cooler lines. This thing has a transmission cooler built into the side of the radiator to help remove some of the heat from the transmission and put it into the coolant stream. So the normal way the coolant flows is it comes from this end, flows across and then comes down here and returns back to the engine. So this is actually the cool side of the radiator. So this is why the fluid cooler is over here. Okay, so we're gonna take this clamp off for the line going to the degas bottle. And this car has a degas bottle. Some of them will have the uh, cap on the side of the radiator or on the top, but this one has a degas bottle, so there's no cap on the radiator. So what I normally do is 
I take the, uh, I put a pan underneath here at the bottom so any transmission fluid will spill into that. Now, this actually has an auxiliary transmission cooler in the front. You can't see it right now, so that's why the fluid comes from the transmission, goes up, goes through this cooler, and then goes to the secondary one. So this thing's almost out. So I'm gonna go ahead and loosen this clamp and then take these two cooler lines off and get them out of the way, and I'll be back. All right, now the lower hose is off, so we're gonna take these transmission cooler hoses off. Nope. There we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this one off and the lower one, and I'll be back with you. All right, well, when you disconnect the tranny lines, you're gonna get some nasty transmission fluid. This thing's gonna get a flush. But what I'm gonna try to do is pick it up and out without dumping too much on the driveway. So I usually will rock it back and forth. That one's up. That one's up. Okay. Lift. And get her out if she doesn't catch on anything. Okay. All right. She is out. Get the new one out of here. Now it's got these little plastic guys on there. Don't forget to pull these uh, these plugs out. <laughs> you can put the hose on with them in there. And uh, yeah, you'll wonder why your car's overheating and it's not a good thing. So this one's on the outer, that one's on the inner. So kind of an ask me how I know situation. So let's get this guy. Tilt it back in. Get the cooler line out of the way. Nope. You don't want to get ATF on the lip where the hose goes. Then it'll be more inclined to come off. So that's down. So just push that on there and tighten her up. That side's already in, so I'm gonna go ahead and get the brackets, set it on, and uh, we can go from there. That's on. Next step is to install the transmission lines. Now there's an O-ring in here, and we shouldn't need it. Okay, well the radiator is in. I gotta take this hose clamp off and hook this up and tighten the transmission lines, but for now, the radiator's in. We're back, and there's actually some daylight today, so see if we can get some stuff done. We left off, I put the radiator in, and now we're gonna try to get this water pump out. The water pump's hiding behind this pulley. It's right down in here, so we gotta get these screws out first, or those bolts, I'm sorry. So we're gonna use the impact, and we'll get a 10 millimeter. Okay, we got our 10 mil, and we gotta be real careful with this because if we take it out and back it too far, it's gonna smack the radiator. So, that one's out. All right, so I'll get all these guys out. And then the other bolts that hold the water pump in should also be a 10, if I recall. So what I'm gonna do is there's one here, one here, one here, and one on the underside. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna crack them loose with the regular ratchet. And then because they're pretty long, I'm gonna unscrew them with the electric ratchet. So, get those out. Things 
almost dead. Alright, now what I've always done is the pump's out. We just have to pop it out now. You can usually get a, a, a screwdriver wedge down in here, but since the alternator is in place in the little area where you wedge the screwdriver isn't accessible, I'm just going to tap this guy with a hammer gently. Just careful not to slip and hit the radiator. You don't really want to wedge a screwdriver in there because you'll screw up your mating surface. So just go in a circle tapping this thing around the pulley and it will come out. And it just wants to hit the radiator. So I'm gonna keep tapping in a circle and get it out. When I do, I'll come back to you. All right, now the water pump is out and you can see it's all gross and corroded around this little freeze plug. So. It's been leaking from there for a while. So this guy's out. While this is out, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, disconnect the, uh, the hose going to the heater core and we're gonna flush some water through it. So let me get that set up, I'll be right back. All right, now what I did is I disconnected the hose right here. This is the hose going to the heater cores. So I'm gonna try to flush it out. It'll come out the center right here if there's any debris in there. So. I want to try to get anything that's in here out because it's, you know, the heater core's got a bunch of crap in it. So I have it routed here to my hose. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it on and see what happens. All right, as you can see, it's coming out. I'm catching it in that pan down there, but I wanna make sure that there's no crap in the heater core. No, I know there is. See if I can pinch the line and send it to the rear heater core. Move that pan real quick. So I'm gonna go ahead and pinch the line going to the rear heater core, or the front one, send all the water to the back. Now I'm getting some flow from the rear one. So it's working. There's just not as much as I'd like. So I'm gonna try to reverse it. We'll see what happens. All right, now I'm flushing it the other way. Back in through the water pump, inlet hole, through the heater cores and back out. I'm trying to get any garbage that's in there out while I'm doing all this, so. Water's coming out clear, that looks good. I'm gonna disconnect all this and I'll come back to you. Okay, well here's the new water pump. Nice and shiny got this o-ring on it so I'm gonna lube up the o-ring before we install it so that when you push it into the water pump housing it doesn't bind up or anything so like again dielectric grease I mean it works for almost everything so just a little bit will do just to make sure the ring has some lubrication on it all right put that on the table So, this part should be mounted down, the part with the little freeze plug, just like the other one. And then this hole right here is a weep hole. So, what it's supposed to do is when the bearing, the seal in here goes bad, water's supposed to come out of that and tell you. So, but it didn't in the other one. This freeze plug at the bottom was leaking. So, same thing. But what you want to do is just kind of line it up and just give it a good push. And it just rolled right in like that. So take the bolts and installation is the reverse of taking it out. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten all these up and I'll be right back. Okay. Now I snug the water pump bolts up kind of like I showed you guys how to in the tire video. Same thing. I go cross. You don't want to do one side at the same time because you can get things unequal. So I'm going to do this side first. I'm gonna do, sorry, I'm gonna do the bottom first. Then 
then the top, then the passenger, then the driver. Okay, water pump's pretty much done. So that's good, that's one hurdle down. Now I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put the pulley back on with a little impact and I'll be right back with you. Water pump pulley's on, can't forget to plug this back in. The line that goes to the heater cores. Now I say cores because this has front and rear heat. So make sure you put that back on. We can actually put the belt back on. So let me go grab the belt. I'll be right back. I know some other vehicles have it too, but this is your belt routing diagram. It shows you how to install the belt onto this engine because, I mean, believe, believe me, it can go on multiple ways, but only one is right. You put it on wrong, it might grind on that. Stud sticking out, it might grind on here. You're gonna, if it's wrong, it's just, it's gonna cause you trouble. So you need to follow this. And that's there for your reference. It was nice of them to put that there. Most vehicles have it, but on this Ford, it's gonna be here. Same with the F-150s and stuff. And most of them have it on that plastic cover. So it shows that we're going up and around this idler pulley. So I'm gonna shove this guy down here. Sorry for the crappy lighting. This time of the year is terrible if I want to document stuff like this and it's getting dark. Okay, so it's showing it goes around the AC compressor. Then it comes up around this one and hits the alternator. Well, I'm gonna leave the alternator to last because it's easiest to get to. So we're gonna run it down around the pulley to the crankshaft. Pulley. Then it shows it coming up to the water pump and then down to the power steering. Now it's the same thing like taking it off. It obviously won't go on right now, but I have to use the ratchet. So since the alternator is easiest to get to, that's the last one I'm gonna put on. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in there, push it down and bring it up and let it go. And it's on. You just kind of check, move your hand around to make sure that it's not hanging off any of the pulleys. Nice thing about these belts is they're fairly self-centering, so it's kind of crooked on the pulley. As soon as you start it, it'll center itself. So that belt's on. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put the ratchet away and we'll move on to the next thing. Okay, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna change the thermostat. Now, there's a bracket right here that holds the power steering reservoir, so I took it off. Thermostat lives under here. So there should be two 10 mils to get it out. And I mean, this isn't 100% necessary, but I figure while I'm in here, may as well. That way I can assure I have a good one. Now these do have a torque, it's 22 foot pounds. So when I put this in, I do have to retorque it. Now I don't know if this has ever been done or what. So I figure, hey, this thing's new to me, never hurts. So let's take these out, they're gonna be long because they go all the way through to the intake manifold to help hold it down to the cylinder head. Get this bolt out of the way and there it is. Now what the thermostat does is it opens and closes to maintain engine temperature and it's, this one's actually really stuck in there. So I'm gonna go grab a uh, pair of channel locks and get it out. Okay, and now it's out. This one was stuck in there really good so I'm wondering if it was uh, one of the original ones. It's a motorcraft on it, so it might be. So what it does is when it, when this part gets hot, it's supposed to open and let, uh, let coolant flow through the radiator versus just flowing through the heater system. But as any wear item, they do get tired. So I bought a new one and it'll come with a gasket that you won't be able to use. You need this round one. They have one that goes on the outer ring here, but it increases the diameter too much and it won't fit. So it's supposed to fit like this. And then this O-ring goes on top of it. Well, what I do on these is 
It has this little brass guy in here, which is supposed to be an air bleed, but what I do is I drill this little hole in here, and what it helps do is it lets some of the heater water, or once the water is hot, it lets some water through to get to the top, and it helps it react quicker so that it gets a more accurate representation of what, what the temperature is versus just being here, and I've found it helps bleeding the air out, makes it a whole heck of a lot easier because what'll happen is when this creates pressure, it'll push this brass guy closed and so the air can't get out. This little hole will help a lot. So I just, you just put that in and face it towards the front of the radiator, put it in and then put the thermostat housing back on, but I'm actually gonna kind of scrape it and clean all the crap off of it with a razor, so I'll be right back with you. Okay, so it's cleaned up a little bit. So we'll go ahead and put this back. Now it calls for 22 foot pounds. So we'll get these bolts back in. I'm not gonna bore you with it. Well, what I'm gonna do is put these in and get them ready. And then I'll show you the tightening. Okay, now it's snug. So we'll tighten it in a crisscross pattern. And then I, I'm gonna do the inner first and then the outer. So put this on. This is already set to 22 foot pounds. So wait for the click. And try to do it equally. Click. And that's actually not the wrench clicking. That is. So that's what it sounds like. Alrighty, so new thermostats in. I'm gonna go ahead and start putting the fan back on. We'll do the radiator hose last. Alrighty, like I told you guys, I got a new fan clutch. This one's all buggered up and it's one of those things, when you're in here, may as well do it. What the fan clutch does is it controls how hard the fan's running when your engine's working. Basically, it's got this little coil right here and what it does is as the heat moves through the radiator, the hotter it gets, this little coil heats up and it heats up the fluid inside the fan clutch. When the fluid heats up, the fluid gets thicker and it basically locks this thing and forces it to spin using the centrifugal force of the engine. So that's why you'll be going up a hill and the hotter your car gets, you'll usually hear the fan get louder unless it's electric. Well, trucks and larger SUVs and whatnot usually use a fan clutch. So that's why they have it. Some of the newer stuff uses um, the electric fans, but this is the old school way of doing it. This is a severe duty fan clutch. I could have got the standard duty, but this thing's set up with a tow package and whatnot. So I'm gonna be, probably be making her do some work so I'm, I'm okay with the uh, slightly worse gas mileage it'll get when towing as long as it stays cool. So with the new radiator and the new fan clutch and thermostat and water pump, this thing should be running great because it's essentially a brand new cooling system. So all I got to do is take these four bolts out and the fan will lift right off. I'll show you. I got them out. So literally just move it over to this one. and do the opposite. That might be the original fan clutch, but I'm gonna go ahead and put some anti-seize on the inside of this so when I put it back together, it doesn't fight me as much if I ever have to take it off again. Like I mentioned earlier, always tighten them in a cross pattern. Okay, that's that. You wanna pay attention to which way the fan came off so you don't put it on backwards. Otherwise it uh, won't cool as well, if not at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get the fan shroud, position this, and I'm gonna go ahead and reinstall this. Okay, we're ready to install the fan. So put it like that. <clears throat> The fan shroud has a sticker on it, so that goes up, so you can read it. So try to hold on to this blade. 
while this goes in here. No one ever said it, it was easy. If they did, they lied to you. Okay, I'll lower it in. Gonna get the fan centered. transmission cooler line. So let me see if I can get this over to the side a little bit. There we go. There's notches on the bottom, so you gotta make sure you get them in. Let me uh, start this real slow. Come on, where's the threads? should screw on normally. Some of these are reverse rotation, so you gotta be mindful of that. And very mindful not to drop it. You can spin the fan as a whole, or you can spin the hub which I'm doing. Okay. That side's in. And that side's in. Show you what I'm doing. Okay. So you can sorry guys. So you can see it's screwing on. So it'll come to a point when it stops, then I'll use the same tool to take it off, or to put it on than I did to take it off. So let me get them. Fan clutches in. I'm gonna go ahead and put the bolts back in this fan shroud and I'll be back. Alrighty, so fan shroud's in. Time to put the, I don't know what you're gonna call it, upper shroud portion on. It's actually just the information part, but still nice to have on here. They're missing on some cars, especially the sticker being missing kind of sucks because when you go to smog your car, a lot of the times they like to see all the emissions information, so always uh, helps in your favor if you have it. Oh, that one's broken. Guess I gotta buy some more. You can get these little things at the auto parts store. There's a couple that are snapped off, so okay. Well, there's enough on there. Alrighty, so I'm gonna go get the upper radiator hose and uh, put that guy on. We're gonna start with the spring clamp over here. Now I am reusing this hose for now. I am gonna replace it at some point, not too far down the road. These ones feel okay, but this one and the lower one I wanna replace. So these spring clamps suck. There's no other way to say it. They're terrible and they feel really, really good when they let go on your finger. So just be gentle with them, be careful. They had this one on there as a backup. I don't know if it was dripping at some point or whatnot, so I'm just gonna go ahead and tighten it. And then this one is just standard hose clamp. That battery will be next, because that thing's nasty. Mm. 
Okay. Nice and tight. Alrighty. I'm gonna put the air intake back on. Okay. Putting it back is real similar to pulling it out. So, just push it back in. And then down, there it is. So just take the wiring harness for it, which is right there, and hook up to here. That click means it landed home. So I'm gonna go get the other tube. All right, one thing I wanted to show you is this. This is folded back. Somebody shoved this on and didn't pay attention to this and it got caught. So the whole time it's been sucking dirt from around this lip and it's been getting air past this lip versus going through the mass airflow meter. So it's showing funky readings to the engine. So the engine doesn't know that all the doesn't know how much air is actually going in because of this leak. So probably going to replace this intake at some point. Might stick an eBay one on there or something. I mean, I don't see any reason to pay, you know, a whole heck of a lot of money for them. They all do the same. So that'll be another video, but make sure when you have stuff apart to inspect everything that's going back on because that's not good. So I just wanted to show you that. I'm going to go ahead and pop this guy back on. So as you can see, putting the damaged part on first, if it'll let me. And then rotating it. So that way I know for a fact it's actually on. go so gonna tighten that tighten that and plug these in it's easy as this that's from the valve cover this one's from the idle air control valve so go ahead and tighten this guy up Plug this in and tighten this guy up. And that part's in. Last part we'll be hooking up this hose. Okay, so the upper hose is on. Now, what's nice about this cooling system is the top of the radiator is the highest part, so that's where the air is going to travel. Besides the heater core, heater core is high part as well. So well, what's going to happen is the air is going to get trapped in the top of the radiator with nowhere to go. So what they did is they have this little line coming off pretty much the top of the radiator coming over to the degas bottle right here. So what will happen is there'll be a big slug of air sitting here. And then when the thermostat opens, as the radiator fills with water, the water will come through here this way, push all the air out. And so the radiator will essentially be completely full of water. So it's a really good idea that they did that and it's super helpful in uh, getting all the air out. If this wasn't here, it would be really difficult to get the uh, air out. So I'm gonna go ahead and fill this thing. What I'm gonna do is this is Prestone Concentrate, basically meaning it's straight antifreeze. Now what you usually wanna do is if you live in the southwestern part of the US where it doesn't freeze, you can go 70% water, 30% antifreeze, but for everybody else, you wanna go a minimum of 50-50. So 50% 50, 50 antifreeze, 50% water. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour this in, then I'm gonna dilute it with distilled water. And you wanna use distilled water because it's filtered, basically they boil it and filter it, and so all the minerals are removed for it, from it, so you don't have that crap floating around in your cooling system getting stuck in your heater core and whatnot. So I'm gonna dump this in. This is about a gallon. If I recall this cooling system, I don't remember the capacity on it, but I remember that if you change the radiator, it ends up being about two gallons to get it right. So a gallon of this and then a gallon of distilled water and then whatever's left in the, uh, whatever's not in the heater core. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the distilled water and start adding that as well. Now the reason antifreeze is important is it does multiple things besides stopping your cooling system from freezing. 
you ever get it on your fingers, it's real slippery. That's because some of the chemicals in it act as a lubricant for your water pump so that the bearing and the seal don't go dry or lose lubrication and end up frying. And it acts as an anti-corrosive, so it stops the, uh, it stops galvanic corrosion from happening, which is corrosion that occurs when different types of metal are in the same system, because you have aluminum in the radiator, in the heads, you most likely have copper in the heater core, you have aluminum on the top of the heads, on the cylinder heads, you have cast iron in the block, and just having all those different metals and heat can create havoc when it comes to corrosion so the antifreeze stops the corrosion and it keeps your the coolant from freezing it raises the uh i'm sorry it just keeps it from freezing it won't let it form ice because what will happen is in a closed environment the as the water expands when it's freezing it has nowhere to go so it'll it can split your block crack your radiator blow a freeze plug out the side of the block and it can wreak havoc so you know it's really really important to keep your coolant percentage right now they have devices where you can stick it in your radiator or your bottle and it'll take a sample and it'll tell you where the um it'll tell you what the percentage is those are hydrometers they have them for batteries too so it'll tell you exactly what your percentage is so i'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit more coolant and a little bit more water to this thing because the line is right here and we are most definitely below it and now we are ready to start it these three are the engine cover and then these are the skid plate in the front. I'm going to go ahead and put that on in a little bit after I make sure there's no leaks. But if you don't feel like buying distilled water and antifreeze separate and mixing it yourself, you can buy standard 50-50 already pre-mixed. So save some time for you so you don't have to worry about the getting the mixture correct. But should be ready to start up. We're going to start it, turn the heater to full and just gonna let it warm up. So I'm gonna go ahead and start it and I'll uh, come back with you in a few minutes. Now when you start a car up that has a fan clutch, a lot of the time, like you can hear the fan right now, the fan will be noisy for the first few minutes until the fluid inside of it spreads outwards with centrifugal force because it's cold right now, so it doesn't need the fluid in there. So it's gonna spread to the outside and then the fan will stop. So early in the morning, you hear a noisy fan. It's perfectly normal. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this guy warm up and I'll be back with you. Alrighty guys, she's warming up. As you can hear, it's just hunting back and forth now. It got really quiet. You can hear how nicely the engine's running. I need to really do something about this battery because that's disgusting. But that'll be a uh, task for another day. She's warming up nicely. The thermostat should open at about 195, so. We'll, uh, we'll see where she's at. Well, she is up to temperature, 199 degrees. So, just sitting here. Oops, let's see. Right in the center on the needle. Heat's nice and warm. I think I'm gonna have to do this rear heater core because it's not blown as warm as the fronts is, but. Oh yeah. Nice and toasty. So, that's all there is to it, guys. I mean, looked kind of complex, but it's really not. Trick will be to drive it around for the next couple days and get it, uh, get it warm. And then um, once it's warm, you know, check the coolant and it'll uh, work all the air out on its own. So, hope you enjoy the video. Like I always say, if there's something you want to see, let me know. I'll try to do it, but there's going to be a lot more projects I'm going to do on this thing. So. Hopefully uh, you guys enjoy them and uh, see you then. All right, bye.